On the 12th of June 2020, millions of eagle-eyed gamers poured into a live stream hosted by Sony Interactive Entertainment. They were announcing their hotly anticipated ninth generation gaming console, the PlayStation 5. Hype for the PS5 had been building slowly. This live stream broke records as millions of gamers were stuck in their homes, blasting through their backlogs, eagerly awaiting news of this next generation of video games consoles. This stream opened with the announcement of a new Spider-Man title. We got information and footage of a new Gran Turismo, a new Horizon game was announced, and Bluepoint Games were making a Demon Souls remake. But. Somewhere between all these huge announcements and expensive AAA games was something smaller, stranger, and particularly unique. This was Bug Snacks. The trailer was a revelation. The theme song, It's Bug Snacks, written by indie pop group Kero Kero Bonito, conjured up memories long forgotten of Saturday morning cartoons with their theme songs, earworms designed to infect the minds of children, and convince them to become invested in a world where anything could happen. After the hype had died down from the initial PS5 announcement, journalists and gamers found themselves asking, what was that weird game with the Muppets and the Bugs? Bug Snacks? Uh, what's a Bug Snacks? And why can't I shake that catchy theme song from my mind? The game was special, and we could tell that before we'd even played it. I think Bug Snacks is one of the defining games of the decade, and by the end of this video, I hope you'll understand why, and perhaps even agree with my perspective. But let's not get too ahead of ourselves, for first we must journey to Snack Tooth Island and see what all this fuss around bug snacks is really about. So bring your raincoats, boots and omnivorous tendencies with you. Things are about to get a little weird, I should say at this point. I'm going to spoil the entire game. If you haven't played it and don't want to completely spoil it, I get it. Feel free to click off this video. If you have and want to see someone else's opinion on it, welcome. Or if you're the kind to not mind spoilers, that's cool too. I'll give you another warning before I talk about the end game and any major spoilers. Thank you. And welcome to Snack Tooth Isle. Bug Snacks opens with you receiving a video from the presumably famed explorer, Lisbert Megafig. She explains that she has discovered the fabled Snacktooth Island, a land full of mysterious, delicious creatures called bug snacks. Lisbert is a grumpus, a kind of fuzzy walrus muppet hybrid. Grumpuses are these world's inhabitants, and grumpuses, their cultures, and their world are all extremely human. I promise we'll get to that later. In Bug Snacks, you play a journalist with a history of writing erroneous articles. Your search for the fabled Grumpfoot turned out to be a lost football mascot, and your boss Clumby Clumbernuts chews you out over this Bug Snacks video. They say Elizabeth is a con man whose search for Grumplantis was ridiculed. Eventually, Clumby concedes, and you're given an ultimatum. If you can get an interview with Lisbert and make it back alive, you can keep your job. So, with zero apprehension about Lisbeth's checkered past or the possible dangers before you, you charter an airship and set sail for Snacktooth Island. As you arrive on this uncharted island, you are hit by a mysterious flying pizza and are thrown from the wreckage, awakening on the ground, a little shaken but unharmed. Lisbert, is that you? Oh, thank Grump you're alive. Too bad I'm dying, though. <laughs> what? Oh, this is me, Philbo. You stumble upon a Grumpus, who's looking a little worse for wear. This is Philbo Fiddlepie, the first of the island's residents you meet, and the foil to your eternally competent protagonist. Philbo has collapsed due to starvation, as his incompetency in the hunting of bug snacks is as apparent as his low self-esteem. 
His meeting acts as a tutorial and is an excellent way for me to explain just how the gameplay loop of Bug Snacks works. Philbo tasks the player with the goal of catching and feeding a strabby to him, a strawberry shaped bug snack. In Bug Snacks, the titular snacks can be caught in a variety of ways. You first must observe the snacks' patterns. All of the snacks move in repetitious patterns, patrolling areas, walking around in circles, or flinging themselves across the map. The player must scan and observe these to determine if they're aggressive, if they're easy to scare, are they on fire or otherwise unattainable? It's only through observing these patterns that the player can deduce how to catch them. In an interview with Six Axis, John Murphy, co-founder and game designer of Bug Snacks developer Young Horses, cites Ape Escape and Pokemon Snap as influences over the gameplay. In Pokemon Snap, players travel on rails along a pseudo roller coaster, taking pictures of Nintendo's infamously profitable, adorable monsters. It's clear taking pictures to analyze the bug snacks has evolved from this idea. In Sony Computer Entertainment's Ape Escape series, players are tasked with hunting the titular apes, viewing the apes' patterns and deducing which traps to hunt them with. It's clear that in some respects, Bugsnax is somewhat of a spiritual successor when it comes to this gameplay loop. Now we can analyze the patterns and identify the names of various bug snacks alongside some hints regarding which condiment is their preference. The question becomes how best can we capture them? Fortunately, in bug snacks, players have a number of tools available to them for hunting the titular critters. Philbo hands us our first tool, the snack trap. The snack trap is a spring-loaded net that when a snacks enters the capture radius of, you can snap shut and trap these often disorientated edible critters. You also have a slingshot with which you may fire numerous sources in order to lure the snacks with. There are six kinds of sauce available in Bug Snacks and these are ketchup, chocolate, hot sauce, ranch, peanut butter, and cheese. With most bug snacks preferring the source that grows conveniently a few feet away from their locations. The other tools you have available to you in bug snacks are a strabby trapped in a ball with which you can coat in a sauce and lure bug snacks with, a lunch pad, a launch pad style device with which you can fling yourself or your trap into the air and catch hard to reach bug snacks or douse flaming bug snacks in water a grapple gun, the snack grappler, with which you can grab items or remove the shells from bug snacks with, and finally a tripwire device named the trip shot. This proves to be an invariably useful tool as any bug snack that touches this is entirely incapacitated for a short period of time. In my gameplay you will see me use the trip shot constantly. After retrieving the strappy for Philbo, you feed it to him, and his pudgy little arm transforms into a strawberry. You see, when Grumpuses consume bug snacks, their bodies are transformed into grotesque, monstrous creations of your choosing. Their limbs, teeth, eyes, even the colour of their skin can change, for they always accept bug snacks, as these Grumpuses can never say no to more bug snacks, which is something else we'll come back to later. After mutating Philbo's body, he informs you that Lisbeth has mysteriously disappeared. You go back to his abandoned town Snacksburg to interview him and to find out what's happened to her. The areas of Snack Tooth Island are varied and video gamey. These include a desert with pyramid style structures and spicy bug snacks, a freezing cold mountain filled with the old camps of previous Grumpus explorers, an idyllic forest, and a beach overflowing with lava and tropical bug snacks. All the areas are peppered with the ruins of previous civilizations, adding depth and a great example of environmental storytelling. In the center of all these areas, serving as a central hub on a spoke wheel design, is the village of Snacksburg. Having been abandoned by its residents following a huge argument after Lisbeth's disappearance, Philbo explains that you may be able to find out more regarding Lisbeth if you can interview the other residents. To do that first, you'll have to bring them back to town. No small feat. 
Snacksburg is a small campfire surrounded by huts, homes belonging to each of the Grumpuses you're tasked with returning. As you bring them back to Snacksburg, their homes begin to open and you learn more and more about these Grumpuses. The first Grumpus you meet on your way back to Snacksville is Wambus Troubleham. Wambus is a tall, wheat-chewing blue-collar farmer with a southern accent. Wambus Troubleham, farmer. To start a farm? Like I can afford that. Seems like you never had to pay property taxes. Wambus's great fear is a fear of failure. Both as a farmer, in his inability to own land and grow crops, but also his failure as a husband. His wife, Triffany, has left him to explore the island on her own, and he's too stubborn to admit his farm isn't working. Wambus has become so forlorn with his wife leaving him that he has created a cactus facsimile of her, which on the surface is humorous. At midnight, we discover him talking to the cactus, confessing how lonely and desperate he has become. Oh, Triffy, I miss you so much. I would hug your cactus facsimile, but it would only hurt me further. And it's the first instance that the story Bugsnax is telling us might be much darker than we initially thought it would be. The next miserable Muppet walrus we discover is Befika Winklesnoot. Befika is a short, heavy-set grumpus, an ex-paparazzi and self-confessed information specialist. I'm Befika Winklesnew, and I basically do whatever I want. <laughs> Let's just say I'm an information specialist. Befika refers to you as her bestie. She speaks in a valley girl accent with her subtitles littered with cutesy smiley faces and love hearts. She tasks you with discovering the secrets of the other Snacksburg residents. You see, Befika's fear and her reason to come to Snacks Tooth Island in the first place is her loneliness. She alludes to her friends and loved ones turning their backs on her after an unnamed incident, alongside her fleeing some kind of legal troubles on the mainland. After we discover all the secrets of the island's residents, Befika realizes that these secrets don't actually make her feel any better. She says all of her friends abandoned her the second she said something they didn't want to hear. She even jokes about her constantly calling you her bestie, remarking how sad that is when she barely knows you. Her facade finally dropped, and the vulnerable real Befika is shown. We empathize with her pain. It's a powerful moment, and it's just the start of these Grumpus's journeys. The third Grumpus we're introduced to is unique among the Grumpuses of Snacktooth Island. For Gramble Giggle Funny abstains from the carnivorous temptations the other ones have succumbed to. Gramble treats Bug Snacks as his self-proclaimed family. He knits clothes that look like the Bug Snacks, he names all of his Bug Snack pets, and even admits to covering himself in sauce every morning so that they'll pay attention to him. Trying to breed Bug Snacks together. It's been real tricky because they don't got any obvious, um, bits to them. Gramble came to the island following Lisbeth in search of a new family. He alludes to something awful happening to them as they are all gone now, and his fear of losing his family drove him to Snacktooth Island. The bug snacks are clearly a replacement for them. His pacifism upsets Wambus, as Wambus treats them as walking vegetables like a farmer would. Their fight was one of the major reasons for the Grumpuses departing Snacksburg, and Gramble has grown distrustful of all the other Grumpuses. Which, yeah, he, he probably has pretty good reason for, considering the voracious way they consume bug snacks. Side note, I did find out, after finishing this game for a second time and recording all the footage for this video, that it is in fact possible to trick Gramble into eating bug snacks while he sleepwalks. This is obviously a horrendous invasion of his rights and a bit gross, so I chose not to do it. After these three return home to Snacksburg, Philbo decides a party would be the perfect way to gain a sense of unity among the Grumpuses of Snacksburg. You're really doing it! You're bringing everybody back! You even got Befika here, and she's awful. <laughs> you know what we should do? We should throw a welcome back party! 
Naturally, the party turns into a disaster, with Gramble and Wambus at each other's throats over their fundamental philosophical differences. It's your fault we're in this mess. If you'd have let us eat your precious livestock, we could have kept together. They weren't livestock. They were my little ones, my kin. You lied and stole them away because you can't grow food for yourself. You think these walking vegetables are your family? I got news for you, Gramble. Bug snacks will never love you. You don't know a thing about love! That's why your wife left you! Philbo decides that clearly more Grumpuses must be found, including Wambus's wife, Triffany, as she may be able to rein in Wambus's animosity to Gramble. As a present for helping him rebuild his town, he gives you your first bug snacks. Unfortunately, and extremely conveniently, you're allergic. Something I think the others will soon wish they were. After all, shoveling living creatures down your throat to transform your body into grotesque monstrous shapes can't have any adverse effects, right? After spending the evening in the communal lavatory, you head out to find the remaining Grumpuses and bring them back to try and piece together the disappearance of Lisbeth. It's at this point, I should say, I'm playing on the PlayStation 5 version of the game. All the footage I've captured is from this version, and I'd like to speak about the excellent implementation by Young Horses of PS5 specific features. On the DualSense controller, the adaptive triggers help the traps and tools feel more tactile. The trigger, when a book snacks, is within the trap for example, becomes slightly harder to press down, just as your Grumpus is pressing the button on their wrist. The same is true for the Source Slinger, where you can feel the tension and release of firing a source through the triggers. The haptic feedback is another way in which Young Horses has excellently used the DualSense controller. You can really feel your footsteps while walking on sand or grass, it changes. The implementation is subtle, and I have no doubt you're fed up of hearing about journalists and gamers sing the DualSense's praise, but Bugsnacks is an excellent example of how smaller developers can implement the DualSense's unique features to increase a sense of immersion. I'd love to talk about the music of Bugsnacks. While I too fear the wrath of YouTube's copyright system, I will only be playing Bugsnacks music in this section, so if required, I can remove the songs later. I believe the interview music to be one of the best songs I've ever heard in a game. The town theme is also addictive, with a banjo being added whenever you're near Wiggle. It's another simple but wonderful addition, an extra touch in a game full of these small details. While the theme song, It's Bug Snacks, quite rightly has held the spotlight, I believe the entire soundtrack by Seth Parker to be incredible. Equal praise should be heaped on the voice acting in this game, with consistently brilliant performances by every actor, which you would expect from such an excellent cast. There are particularly strong performances by Yuri Lowenthal as Chandlo. It's easy to stay swole in paradise. Easy for me anyway. Roger Craig Smith as Snorpy. Ah, chum, I have such a craving for cookies. Why, my craving is so terrible that I would like my teeth to be quookies, so that I may taste my own teeth, you see. And Casey Mongillo as Snorpy's enigmatic sibling, Floofty. Despite your lack of any and all useful skills, I require your assistance. As is extracting feces from the latrine. I believe their performances to be extremely nuanced. While on the surface they appear as cartoonish as their Saturday morning cartoon inspirations, there is a delicacy 
and a depth with which they characterize these grumpuses to make them human. And certainly a lot more complex than I was ever expecting a game about walrus muppets hunting food Pokemon to be. Wiggle Wigglebottom was a pop star. She had huge success with her song Do The Wiggle, a clear parody of songs like Whip Nay Nay or Crank Dat. I'll be honest here, I wrote a full paragraph about her character trying to explain why she might be interesting, but I can't think of anything to say. I hate her. I hate her inclusion in the game. She sings constantly. It's terrible. She has a weird relationship with Gramble. Her entire being in the game has no plot relevance whatsoever. So I'm, I'm just going to skip past her. If you see a tall grumpus walking around with a banjo, it's Wiggle. She's crap. I think it's clear that Bugsnacks is a labour of love for young horses. There are lots of pop culture references and little details littered through the game. Each of the quests in the game are accompanied by a new pencil drawing that perfectly encapsulates the spirit of the quest. Each item in Bug Snacks scanned by your snack scope is accompanied by a quote from one of the island's grumpuses. This is similar to a Pokedex entry, but with more humour and individuality. The game's humour as a whole is excellent. Humour is a notoriously difficult thing to nail in a video game, with very few games properly capturing such a subjective thing. I do believe Bugsnacks is the funniest game I have played in a long, long time. Its humour runs the gamut from dad-style puns, parodies of pop culture, to excellent one-liners. It's all presented with an earnestness that's devoid of any cynicism, making it appear even more like a lost Jim Henson production. The next Grumpus we meet is an interesting one. His name is Cromdo Face. He's a gruff Danny DeVito in Matilda style con man, sporting a garish spotted tie and a cheap suit. The name's Cromdo Face, the one and only salesman in paradise. Cromdo is an independent businessman and founder slash proprietor of Snack Tooth Isle's best and only shop, Cromdo Mart. Cromdo saw Lisbeth as a gold mine and Bug Snacks as a business opportunity ripe for exploitation and, most importantly, quick profit. He left Snacksburg because Befica caught him riling through Lisbeth's possessions after her disappearance. He immediately tries to con the protagonist into giving him an exorbitant amount of Bug Snacks in exchange for a rickety, half-broken bridge, which promptly collapses on the player. Convincing him to return to Snacksburg is simple, as he believes the others to be easy to take advantage of. Initially, he appears gruff, callous, and a little rude, but after bringing him countless increasingly hard-to-find bug snacks, including the giant pizza moth that grounded our airship in the beginning, he finally opens up to us. Prior to his life on the island, he wasn't some smooth-talking con man at all. He's a salesman, and from the sounds of it, a pretty bad one. He hated his job on the mainland and escaped here as part of a midlife crisis. He confesses to hating being a scumbag, a hustler, as he puts it. He's clearly a good man deep down, and it's never said for certain, but in his cabin there's a tie that says number one dad on it, hinting at his reasons for wanting to get rich, maybe even an altruistic motivation to his money obsession. Perhaps it's all for his child. After convincing Cromdo to return, we stumble into the ruins of a desert in search of an intrepid explorer of a different kind. Wambus' no-nonsense wife, Triffany, Triffy, Lotoblog. I'm Triffany Lottablog. You caught me doing some archaeology. Try not to step on the skulls, yeah? She's an archaeologist and a descendant of a famed explorer, Bronica Lottablog. Triffany is following in her grandma's footsteps as Bronica was the grumpus who first discovered Snacktooth Island, and she hopes to find her grandma's final resting place there. She explains how an ancient culture used to live in the desert here, but all that remains are their bones in strange communal burial sites. She speaks with a strong Minnesotan accent, even referring to Wambus as a hot dish, a traditional Minnesotan meal. Wambus' fight with Gramble scared her, as his aggressive behaviour and refusal to move to the ruins with her drove her to her wit's end. Over the course of the story, you search for ruins with Triffany, and even find a camp she presumes to be her grandma's, including a grumpus skeleton. It isn't her grandma, and she accepts that she has to stop looking at the past and build a future. Sometimes not knowing all the answers is okay. 
With Triffany back, that's three more residents return to Snacksburg. Wambus and Triffy have a heart-to-heart. It's heartfelt and raw. Wambus breaks down and apologises for everything he's done to hurt her. They make up and kiss. It's lovely. And you feel instrumental in returning a little piece of love back to Snacksburg. Welcome home, Triffy. Let's hope the cactus doesn't get jealous. What's that now? Nothing. For a moment, you forget all about Lisbeth and your quest to find her, but more importantly, you forget about the Bug Snacks. This is the secret to Bug Snacks as a game and its success. The Bug Snacks themselves are completely inconsequential. They don't matter. The real heart of the story is here with these grumpuses. Young Horse's focus on empathy is so well realized here, it's astounding. But as much as I'd like a Grumpus marriage counselor game, we're here to find out what happened to Lisbeth and why these Grumpuses can't stop guzzling down 21st century fighting foodons. A fog descends over Snacksburg and all these Grumpuses warm themselves by the fire. They tell spooky stories about ghosts or creepy things they think they have seen, with Wiggle declaring in an awful sing scream about the Queen of Bug Snacks, a mythical creature she claims to have seen. A terrible crash is heard over by the mill house. Plucking up the courage to go investigate, you and Philbo discover that it's not a ghost or a queen of bug snacks, but rather an affable bro-y grumpus, Chandlow. He's come back to check the town is okay after seeing the smoke from your fire and grabs some supplies for him and his friend. He says he'd love to return, but he can't without his best friend Snorpy agreeing. So the next morning, you decide to scale the freezing cold mountain to find those two grumpuses, convince them to return, and find out just what they know about Lisbeth's disappearance. Chandler Funkbun and Snorpington Snorpy Fizzlebean are unique in that you recruit the two of them together, for these two Grumpuses are entirely inseparable. They are also by far the most endearing and likeable characters in the game, and definitely my favourites. Since leaving Snacksburg, Snorpy's anxiety has been getting worse. He's becoming increasingly paranoid and fearful of the world. Chandlow, trying to help Snorpy with the power of positivity, convinces Snorpy to leave his house by using his brute strength to literally lift the side of his cabin up. It's an adorable moment and an excellent way to introduce you to the dynamic of these two. Chandlow would literally lift a house to help his friend. Chandlow tasks you with helping him retrieve his basketballs and increase his gains. Chandlow is a muscular gym bro whose personality is built upon the secret inspired affirmations and gym culture. He peppers his speech with yells of dog and bro. Gonna quiz me dog? I'll crush your questions! Chandler thinks bug snacks could be the solution for him to become extra swole and defy what is physically possible for Grumpuses. However, it's not Chandler and his endless positivity on his own that makes the character so endearing, but his relationship with Snorpy that brings me so much joy. Snorpy Fizzlebean is the inventor and creator of all your amazing gadgets and tools. He's a conspiracy-loving, anxiety-suffering, hug-obsessed mad genius who believes that the Grumpinati are secretly controlling the entire Grump world and have been hiding the secrets of bug snacks. I suppose I can reveal a tad bit, so long as my identity is protected. <clears throat> I am Snorp Redacted Bean, and I have devoted my life to inventing devices that foil the machinations of the Grumpinati. After bringing him some bug snacks, Snorby confesses a secret to you, one that he fears could ruin the thing most dear to his heart his friendship with Chandler, because Snorpy is secretly in love with his best friend. After convincing the lovable bros back to Snacksburg and receiving a very, very long enthusiastic hug from them. Bro, if I didn't think it'd crush you like a tin can, I would hug the grump out of you. Oh, what the grump? Here it comes! What expert hugging that is, you do that hug. 
While I have been extremely positive about my experience with Berg Snacks, which overall has been a very enjoyable experience, I do want to highlight some negatives that stop my praise from being entirely profusive. This game has an over-reliance on fetch quests, with almost all of the side quests devolving into catch X number of bug snacks and feed them to X Grumpus. While the story and conversations these quests reveal are often excellent additions that make the Grumpuses feel well-rounded and often deep in their backstories, I found the repetitive nature of them to overstay their welcome. This is especially true on repeat playthroughs. Unfortunately, the game has surprisingly little replay value with no meaningful choices or alternate paths for any of the quests. This has made the second playthrough of this game that I have done for this video at times rather tedious. Another issue I have with bug snacks is in the catching of bug snacks themselves. The reward is rather lackluster. You either propel a side quest on further with a caught bug snack or use it to transform the grumpuses. That's all. This is fine for snacks that take 20 seconds to catch, but there's little reward for capturing a more complex snack. For example, one that's on fire or runs away from you. When all your bug snacks are worth a bug snack, what is the motivation for the player to hunt the more difficult ones, save from the challenge itself? Pokemon, alternatively, rewards the more difficult Pokemon by making them more powerful or rare. The legendary Pokemon are notoriously difficult to catch. Bug Snacks doesn't do this. I cannot hope but feel like the Bug Snacks themselves were almost an afterthought in the development of this title. A number of the game's side quests lead to the capturing of giant bug snacks, uh, almost legendary bug snacks. While on the surface this seems a great way to finish the Grumpus' side stories, they discover this fabled snack they wanted, only to find out that the bug snack didn't fix their issues, and tying this into gameplay is an excellent idea. However, the mechanics for capturing bug snacks themselves were never intended to be used in such large-scale encounters. The boss encounters last far too long, which makes makes them a consistently frustrating occurrence. A particularly egregious moment is the Moths the Supreme fight, as the culmination of Cromdo's side quest, the player is tasked with capturing the bug snack that grounded your airship at the start of the game, and whose looming presence can be felt and heard over the desert. Unfortunately, even on my second playthrough, the encounter continued to be extremely frustrating because the mechanics used to trap bugs have been jammed into boss battles. It just doesn't work. The game's lack of failure states and poor player feedback results in a frustrating experience. The lack of fast travel is another issue I have with this title. While Snack's Tooth Isle is small enough to be traversed in minutes and the player speed is extremely fast, the game requires you to continuously backtrack to areas you've previously visited. This is especially true for side quests. A return to Snacksburg button would have been an extremely welcome feature. There are shortcuts between areas, but these are only accessible through solving a puzzle. I believe these being a reward for doing side quests or the main story itself would have made backtracking through these areas less frustrating. This is especially true with the title's very short loading times thanks to the PS5's lightning quick SSD. In an interview with Shaq News, Phil Tobotsky stated Young Horse's intention was to create a game without failure states, to make it as accessible as possible. I do believe they have achieved this in many respects. The game is extremely accessible and a game I would recommend to people not used to operating first person cameras or using dual sticks. But there are issues present in the game regardless of character deaths and checkpoints. Fire mechanics are difficult to manage. The second your equipment catches fire, it breaks. Snorpy clearly has yet to invent fireproof traps. When your character is damaged by fire, they're set aflame and run around for a long time flailing their grumpus arms in the air unless cooled by water. This is extremely frustrating in a game where you often have no control directly over the bug snacks you are catching. Waiting for an inconsistent outcome is rarely ideal in a game. These issues I have with the game do prevent it from being perfect, but they are small enough, especially when we consider the excellent presentation and the quality of writing and performances that elevate bug snacks past these minor issues. We had just returned Snorpy and Chandlow back to Snacksburg and collapsed in bed from exhaustion. 
we're woken in the middle of the night by Bethika screaming and claiming her and Gramble saw a monster. The others are understandably skeptical, and an argument ensues. You put your Witcher medallion on and do your best Geralt impression and look for clues, finding creepy footsteps and a sinister sign etched in the woods saying, no, more, bug snacks. Tensions are understandably high in the camp, and old rivalries begin to flare up. Snorpy assumes it's the work of the Grumpinati. Wiggle blames the Queen of Bergsnacks again. Seeing this unease and fearing civil unrest, Philbo tasks you with finding the last three remaining Grumpuses and attempting to ensure the safety from this unforeseen outside threat. First, we're going to find the wisest of all the Grumpuses, Shelsey Shelda Woolbag. She's an old Grumpus who appears initially as a wise guru, speaking in nonsense pop philosophy riddles, referring to herself as one, making references to inner peace and a godlike being called the mother. She speaks constantly of the temptations of bug snacks and appears as a stereotypical hippie type, adorned with a headband of flowers and a necklace featuring the peace symbol. She returned to the island to isolate herself from the world she views as poison. She describes a lack of interest in consuming the bug snacks, however, she constantly asks for bug snacks to be placed in her special container. The next day, we can see her body is transformed. She's clearly ashamed of her inability to remain pious and succumbs to the temptations of bug snacks, as most of the Grumpuses do. Alongside Wiggle, I believe she is among the worst characters in Bug Snacks and almost entirely inconsequential to the story. She represents young horses padding out the game and completely unnecessary addition to the title. I do wish that Shelda was not in the game. It's off to Boiling Sands to find the Grumpus with the answers, or at least some of the answers we hope. Floofty Fizzlebean is Snorpy's estranged sibling, a scientific genius and the foil to Snorpy's conspiracy theories and pseudoscience, greeting his nonsense with consistent apathy. Floofty is so committed to the field of scientific research that they have decided to remove their own leg to prove their hypothesis correct regarding Bugsnack's ability to regrow lost body parts, and they view Bugsnacks themselves as a breakthrough in medical research. The other residents have seen Floofty dragging a severed limb around and have misguidedly grown to assume Floofty is a cannibal. Needless to say, Floofty has preserved their severed limb and has decided not to consume it. Now, it would be impossible to talk about Floofty without saying that Young Horse's inclusion of a non-binary character, whose story arc is not related directly to their identity, should be championed. The character is referred to with they, them pronouns, and all the Grumpuses refer to Floofty as they, them, or as Snorpy's sibling. It's lovely to see this kind of inclusion in video games, something I hope to see more of in the future, and a wonderful way in which Bugsnax is clearly influenced by children's media. In an interview with AIAS Game Maker's Notebook podcast, Young Horse's CEO Phil Tobotsky stated, The company was influenced by children's media that on the surface appeared simple, but contained deeper messages with darker themes, or more personal topics. Steven Universe, Fern Gully, and Over the Garden Wall were all referenced by him as influences over the game, and this direction is something I believe Bug Snacks does effectively. A number of reviews for the title from major publications referenced how unexpectedly dark, personal, and touching Bug Snacks becomes as the story unravels. Clearly, the art style, music, and presentation is all designed to appear as a Saturday morning cartoon with deeper levels, just like Young Horse's influences. And Floofty's inclusion as a non binary character, a topic that might be difficult to discuss and very personal, is a wonderful way to address inclusion in video games. Now let's get back to recruiting Fluffy. They wish to challenge the question of what it is to be a Grumpus. Floofty's apparent success with regrowing their arm using bug snacks has given them a somewhat well-deserved sense of confidence. Floofty's side quest is definitely a highlight of the game. They determine that if bug snacks can regrow a limb, then clearly they can regrow a head and task you with finding some volunteers for their rather gruesome endeavor. Snorpy accuses his sibling of working for the Grumpinati, while Floofty believes he is wasting his talented brain on spy games. Floofty believes Snorpy is a coward, 
who can't tell Chandler that he loves him. The two have some unresolved issues, clearly. After fully transforming Floofty's body into a grotesque monstrosity and climbing into a pizza cutter guillotine, Floofty orders you to funnel bug snacks into their corpse's mouth while they are being beheaded. Fortunately, Snorpy arrives and puts a stop to this macabre spectacle. The siblings argue and Floofty realizes that they've made a fundamental error and they can't make themselves understood. Floofty's inability to understand the other Grumpuses and their lack of social skills are the heart of Floofty's growth. They assume with great scientific endeavors, they won't need aid or support or empathy, but ultimately realize that nothing can be done through sheer force of will and that it's okay to ask for help. Snorpy makes Floofty realize they themselves are also a coward. It's a touching and lovely ending to one of my personal favorite side stories in the game. Now we have only one remaining Grumpus to find, Dr. Egabel Batternugget. Egabel is Snacksburg's erstwhile doctor. She suffers from depression and addiction issues with her bug snacks habit becoming obsessive. In one of the home videos we can unlock in her and Lisbeth's hut, she's become increasingly aggressive towards Lisbeth when Lisbeth questions just how many snacks she has eaten. Egabel feels like her existence is a dead weight to her partner Lisbeth, like she's hanging on to and leeching from Lisbeth's fame and success. Their relationship is complex and relatable. Lisbeth's charismatic, attention-loving, adventurous personality completely overshadows Egabel's delicate, intelligent, and shy demeanor. I believe in video games there is often a tendency to show relationships as overly simplistic. They fail to show the nuance inherent in love. Lisbeth and Egabel's relationship contrast these romanticized depictions of love. Their love is complex and far from perfect. Both characters are deeply flawed and young horses should be championed for showing a surprisingly realistic depiction of that. As we journey up the ever-present looming high peak of the icy cold frozen mountain expecting to find the soft molly coddled grumpus we have seen in the videos, we find a grizzled explorer. She's spent weeks on this freezing cold mountain alone looking for Lisbeth. Sporting a eye patch and an Indiana Jones inspired Federer, this is the opposite of the Egabel we have seen. Egabel believes Lisbeth to be trapped behind a huge door locked by an elaborate, very video gamey puzzle. These statues act as switches and are shaped in the likeness of various bug snacks living on the mountain. After you catch the bug snacks required to open the door, Egabel laments. There are three switches and only two of you. You will need a third Grumpus to trigger the door. Clearly, there's only one capable, albeit slightly useless Grumpus for the task, Philbo. The three of you attempt to open the door. Naturally, it fails and the door refuses to budge. Egabel breaks down, and she admits the truth. I was being stupid, and I slipped up on the cliffs while I was trying to show off. The earthquake hit, and, and I was going to fall, but Liz saved me, like she always does. She got swept away, and then the ground opened beneath her, and it, it swallowed her up. She blames herself for Lisbeth's loss, and Philbo and her have a heart-to-heart. She has one final plan to save her love and instructs you to wait for her in town. With your final interviews conducted and the search for Lisbeth clearly reaching its apex, it's of course time for another party. The next section is the end game. So word of warning, I will be spoiling the end of Bug Snacks, which does contain a number of twists. I reckon if you've made it this far, you're not gonna click off. So let's get stuck in and finally end this game. Philbo is insistent that it's not a true party without everyone dancing, so we're tasked with convincing the Grumpuses to give up their various hang-ups and boogie down. We solve some simple requests for them, mostly getting them drunk and changing the music. These little interactive narrative puzzles are what Bug Snacks does best, in my opinion. We get an excellent resolution to Chandlow, Snorpy, and Floofty storylines. Floofty apologizes and finally acknowledges just how brilliant Snorpy is. And then the moment finally comes. Snorpy asks Chandlow if he wants to be his boyfriend. Chandlow's confused and shocked because they've been dating for years. This moment's wonderful. I love how unexpected it was. I honestly didn't think this would happen. It's endearing and a memorable touching moment. A great ending to one of the best storylines in Bug Snacks. But as is so often the case, just as everything appears to be going well for these Muppet walruses, Our end is nigh. 
What? End? Well, is, is that a metaphor, or...? Gotta move! Now! A mini-apocalypse happens. A huge earthquake shakes the ground and the volcano erupts, spewing smoke and lava into the sky above Snacktooth Isle. The Grumpuses panic. Just when all hope is lost, Egabel returns and explains how she knows just how to save Lisbeth and that the situation on the island is only going to escalate. As you, Philbo, and Egabel go to open the door, the villagers prepare for the worst. The three of you make your way up the mountain and successfully open the gate and fall into goo. This is the underside, the real depths of Snacktooth Island. This poorly textured corridor is composed entirely of bug snacks. We find Lisbeth, or the Dark Souls boss equivalent of her. Putting your reporter's instinct before common sense or self-preservation, you demand an interview from this Frankenstein monster of food and animal parts. She explains that this is the island's true form. They're parasites. They get inside you and they change you, your body and your mind. They make you want them. And before you know it, you become them. They force addiction on you until you consume so many of them, you literally become them. She claims if you show any weakness to the bug snacks, they will exploit it. We can see that this is true as all the grumpuses we've encountered here viewed the bug snacks as a cure-all, a solution to their various underlying problems. The bug snacks are clearly insidious in nature. She informs us that when Lisbeth fell into the underside, saving Egabel, bug snacks swarmed her and crawled down her throat. She fought back through sheer force of will and became a queen of the bug snacks. She claims the bug snacks are in a frenzy to consume the grumpuses. Stopping her killing her friends is literally tearing the ground and herself in two. With a heartfelt apology, she expresses regret to Philbo for bringing the residents of Snacksburg here and filling their bodies with parasites. She brought them here because she didn't know what everyone really needed. She didn't know how to solve their issues. Their bug snacks were a plaster on a deeper wound of these grumpuses. I think it's clear they all needed real help. Is this humanity the Grumpuses show and this vulnerability that make them so endearing? And I think Young Horses has achieved its vision of making truly empathetic characters so that us as the audience can project our own inadequacies, failures, and fears onto. Egabel appears. She scolds Lizabel, telling her she can't play the martyr, refusing to leave without her. But it's too late. Lisbeth has become the snacks themselves. If Lisbeth severs her connection with them, the island will destroy itself and the grumpuses will be consumed. Egabel, in an act of true courage, showing that she's no longer a victim to her addictions and anxieties in a pure act of love sacrifices herself. She climbs into the bug snacks monster with Lisbeth. It's equally disgusting and heartbreaking. The two of them accept their fate. They will try and hold the island together while the grumpuses escape, then they will die together. At this climax, Young Horses does something really interesting. They use cyclative narrative techniques. They repeat the intro to the game. You wake up on the floor in the same spot we started our journey in, with a collapsed Philbo in front of us. It's the same as the intro, except this time we're not the hunters, we're the prey. As the volcano erupts around us, we run back home to warn the residents about Lisbeth, Egabel, and the exodus that must start as soon as possible. Fortunately, Snorpy, ever the ingenious inventor, has modified his traps to become snack-killing machines. We just have to hold off the invasion of Snacksburg long enough until our balloon can take flight again. Bug Snacks, in a third act twist no one could have predicted, then turns into a wave survival game, requiring you to help the Grumpuses ward off the increasingly aggressive parasites. The stakes are real, for if we lose even one Grumpus, the true ending of the game will be lost, and the Grumpinati just might win forever. The truth is that despite the high stakes of this ending, the mechanics of bug snacks were clearly not made for wave-based survival. This sequence is thankfully just short enough to not completely ruin this ending. 
This twist to murdering endless waves of bug snacks is a fun way to mix up the end of the game, and an excellent way to show the creativity of young horses. Seeing Snacksburg in disarray is also suitably grim, with the rivers flowing red with what one hopes is bug juice. Just as it seems all hope is lost, and your ship is doomed to be grounded again at the last moment before certain death, Lizbirds and Eggabell appear. We bid farewell to Snacktooth Island and fly to the safety of the mainland, as far away from bug snacks as we can possibly get. With the ship safely landing on the mainland and the sun setting in the distance, we find ourselves on a beach with all the grumpuses we met along the way, each getting a little bow on the end of their storylines. Wambus accepts that his farm is gone and that it's okay to start fresh again. He understands that failure is inevitable sometimes and that regardless of how doomed we may feel, it's okay to try again and keep trying until we get things right. He stops being a stubborn old man and learns to accept change and not take his love for granted. Triveny accepts that she has become so obsessed with the past, she forgot the future and decides to move forward with Wamba, starting afresh and forging her own legacy together with the man that she loves. Wiggle decides that her muse is now Gramble with inspiration from her love of him, not the bug snacks. Once again, I hate Wiggle. Wiggle is the worst. Gramble acknowledges that leaving his snacks was difficult, but nowhere near as hard as he thought it would be. Moving on and putting the past behind us isn't always as impossible as it seems on the surface. While we must respect our past, it doesn't have to define us, and he feels as though he's finally found his family with Wiggle. Befika decides that returning to her old life and her old friends can never happen because that world is gone, but she knows she can make new friends and start afresh without the past looming over her. She can finally put the past to rest. Cromdo finally accepts defeat and decides he doesn't need a bug snack scam. His midlife crisis is resolved and he accepts that his life wasn't really that bad at all. Floofty realizes that they have to understand Grumpuses to help them and becomes determined to understand their peers and make themselves understood. And yes, they will lose the limb they cut off as a result of their arrogance. That's just something Floofty will have to learn to deal with. Shelda decides to finally stop the facade of being a wise guru, regretting the time she wasted pretending to be an all-seeing shaman, deciding that she doesn't need magical powers or a connection to a goddess to help those in need. She can just give advice. She can be herself. Snorpy realizes that his enemies aren't as all-powerful as he had presumed them to be, and that Chandlo was always there for him. Maybe he could even share his life with him. Chandlo is just thankful Snorpy had his back, deciding that it's okay he hit his physical limitation. He says that together, him and Snorpy have no limit. They can do anything. We stand Snorpy and Chandlo. Finally, it's just you and Philbo on the beach together, watching the sunset and reminiscing on your journey. He asks if he can stay with you and help you finish your story, ever the sidekick ready to aid whoever needs it, as the volcano smoke in the distance rises and the tide ebbs and flows. Our adventure on Snack Tooth Island has come to an end. In a closing cinematic, your boss calls you a Grump to S. Thompson, congratulating you on an excellent article saying that, similarly to Lisbeth's previous endeavours, the bug snacks of Snacktooth Island were a fabrication. You and Philbo have clearly decided to hide the gruesome truth of bug snacks. You are, of course, unceremoniously fired for disappearing, or perhaps you came a little too close to the truth. As the credits of this heartfelt, earnest game scroll, we're presented with different postcards showing the Grumpuses we've come to call friends, all living their lives, having grown from their experiences. While the Bug Snacks theme song plays, the very same song that piqued our interest in the first place months ago. We've come full circle.
as the sun fades, the voice of your former employer can be heard talking about us getting a little too close to the truth. Snobby was right. The Grumpanati was real this whole time. He knew it. On them. Two quid. A das. Omne Vivamex Bug Snacks. Strabble. In his 2014 Game Developers Conference talk, Empathy for Octopodes, John Murphy, the designer and co-founder of Young Horses, talked at length about the lessons the studio learned from the creation and release of their previous title, Octodad Dadliest Catch. Murphy discusses being influenced by Carol Dweck's theory of positive mindset. Dweck's theory of positive mindset posits that the biggest factor in one's success is not an innate ability, but rather the recognition of growth, that one's ideas, intelligence and understanding are not fixed, but flexible and can grow with hard work and determination. I believe we can see this in all the Grumpus' resolutions. They have grown over the course of the game, recognizing their ability to change from within, without the need of an external force to learn and grow from their experiences. This proposal, that no one is ever really trapped in one place or one situation, that we can get help and change, especially in regards to our fears and neuroses, is such a valuable message, and one I'm shocked hasn't been discussed more by reviewers of the title. This positive message regarding mental health as something not taboo or all-encompassing, but a facet of one's personality that can be overcome or even embraced is beautiful and important. And young horses cannot be praised enough for embracing such a positive universal message. When Alexander saw the breadth of his domain, he wept, for there were no more worlds left to conquer. This was said by Hans Gruber in Die Hard, a less prestigious source than one may expect, but these are words that resonate with many young people. I think there is a common fear felt by many millennials. Multinational corporations control our lives. Inequality continues to rise and has continued to compound our sense of dissatisfaction and our lack of control. I believe this to be one of the keys to Bugsnax's success. It's clear the goal of Young Horses was to have the audience empathize with these characters, and they have been more than successful in this in my opinion. The real success of Bugsnax isn't the excellent audio work or the quirky art style, it's that the game holds a mirror up to ourselves. The Grumpuses all represent different facets of the audience, and our shortcomings, our inadequacies. It's for this reason that the Grumpuses are the real stars of Bugsnax, for they display more human traits than most romanticized depictions of humans we so often see in video games. They are fallible and complex, just like we are, and they speak to our deepest fears and ultimately show us our greatest strengths, that we're capable of being more than our fears, that we can overcome any obstacle, even those within us. The island, in many respects, is therapy for these characters, and in the strangest way, in a year fraught with loneliness and lack of control, Bugsnax empowers us, as gamers, to escape our reality and maybe even silence our inner demons. I love Bugsnax. The game is delicate, heartbreaking, and completely unexpected. In a year full of high-profile sequels, a game with fuzzy, empathetic walrus muppets chasing edible, addictive Pokemon came out of left field and became one of the best launch titles I think a system has ever had. It's one of the PS5's greatest titles and a wonderful addition to an ever-growing argument of legitimizing indie games as an art form equally valid to AAA games. I'm not sure I ever want to say goodbye to the Grumpus as a snack tooth aisle, at least not for a while anyway. I'd like to say thank you once again for Young Horses for taking the time to make something so special. I think one day we'll look back on Bugsnax as a monumental title, and I hope that in five years time Young Horses can give us something else equally awesome. Thank you guys and have a lovely day.